Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Christy Gorenson. KSPS is pleased to bring you this debate featuring the candidates running for Spokane City Council from District 2. District 2 is mainly Spokane South Hill, but also extends to the West Plains and includes homes near the Spokane Airport. The candidates in this race are Lori Kinnear and Tony Keepy. Lori Kinnear has served on the City Council since 2015. She's a former small business owner and has served on the Manitou Cannon Neighborhood Council and the Friends of the Centennial Trail. Tony Keepy has recently retired. He's a former small business owner and healthcare consultant with 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. For this debate, the candidates will answer questions from a panel of Spokane journalists. Please welcome Doug Ned Vornick of KPBX Public Radio, Samantha Wolfile, reporter for The Inlander, and Derek Dice, morning anchor for KXLY 4 News Now. Well, here are the debate rules as agreed to by the candidates. The candidates will have one minute for answers. Each candidate will be allowed two rebuttals for the entire debate. Rebuttal length will be limited to 30 seconds. So let's begin. We did a coin flip earlier, and that determined that, Lori, you're going to have the opportunity to answer the first question first, and we're going to start with Derek. Well, homelessness is obviously an issue for us here in Spokane. What are your ideas on how the city should go about combating it, and should the city be helped by the county and other municipalities, or perhaps should they even have their own shelters? I think we should define our terms, and we're talking about people that are unhoused. We know that there are a variety of reasons why people are unhoused. It could be DV victims, children aging out of foster care, vets with PTSD. The city's doing a lot right now to fund providers to provide shelter. And I sponsored a resolution asking the county if they would participate. And so far, we're still working with them. So far, they have, not, they have declined to do so. Um, I'm hopeful that they will come forward and say, yes, we absolutely, it is a regional problem. It is not just a Spokane problem. So I'm hopeful they will come forward and say, yes, we need to solve this problem together. All right, Tony. Uh, we do have a homeless crisis situation right now going on in downtown Spokane. Not just over, just, not over, just over downtown Spokane, but it's reaching even here on the South Hill, 29th, 57th, you see uh, people walking downtown. We have to make changes. Right now we're trying to spend a lot of money uh, if you look at Seattle, they're spending $100,000 per homeless person. That's not working. We have to stop enabling our homeless and give them the help they need. Every person's unique. Every person has their unique story. If they're on drugs, we need to give them drug treatment. If they're on mental health, we need to make sure they get a mental health issue. You have a lot of homeless people, that's the way of life. We can't help those if that's the way they want to live. We have to take them off the streets. Uh, we need to work as a region. I know Spokane Valley's given a couple million dollars to, to the county to help for our homeless. So working for the region, we get to see all the homeless people here in Spokane because we have all the services here, but we have to have some tough love and make sure we move forward with this situation. All right, Tony, you'll take this next question, Samantha. Black and Native American residents are three to four times more likely than their white counterparts to be booked into Spokane County Jail. They're also more likely to be the subjects of use of force by the Spokane Police Department. How should Spokane police address racial disparities in the criminal justice system? I believe right now we have some great training going on with our police department where they are more sensitive to different races, uh, where the crime, crimes have taken place. But we want to make sure that we have good, solid, uh, we want to make sure we have good, solid protection within the city. So we have to make sure everybody's protected and we can't look at somebody's race, creed, or color, sexual orientation based on being a, a criminal or having a criminal act. And the judicial system is totally they don't have the lawyers, the money to spend, so you see more, more racial, racial profiling going on where they're going into jail. All right, Lori, thank you. Racial disparity is a huge problem, and I recently met with Tony Lodge from the Native Project because I wanted to find out what the issues were, and you're right, they are more likely to be booked in jail, they're more likely to be arrested and detained, we have to work with our police department. They're getting better. There's still work to do, but we also have to work with our justice system overall so that when they are booked in jail, if there is a crime committed, that it's, there is equality or there is equity uh, so that they're not profiled, that they're not, um, there's no disparity in that regard. Thank you, Lori. You'll take this next question first, Doug. 
So let's stay sort of in this, this realm here. Um, Lori, how would you evaluate the police ombudsman system in Spokane, and is there a better model? The citizens overwhelmingly passed a charter change to allow us to have an ombudsman. And right now, that ombudsman does not get to do an independent investigation. The citizens said that is what they wanted. They voted on it, and that is what we should provide them. So other than that piece, I think we're moving forward in the right direction. But until we get that independent investigation, we're not going to be doing what the citizens have asked us to do. Thank you, Lori. Tony? Yeah, since the ombudsman's been in place, uh, we've got less reports going on right now. I think they're doing their job, they're being effective, but we need to make sure they have oversight and independent uh, oversight of the judicial system or the police system. But uh, I definitely support the ombudsman and where we are right now. All right, thank you. Let's see, Tony, you'll take this next question. We'll move on to Derek. Yeah, the city has the goal of receiving all of its electricity from renewable sources by the year 2030. So. How realistic is this goal in each of your eyes, and what steps can the city be taking now to get us pointing in that direction? Well, right now, I have solar panels on my house. I'm doing what I think I need to do to be a little bit greener, but I did it more for uh, financial reasons. It was a big investment at first, but with the rebates, national rebates given back, the Avista rebates, uh, if everybody did that, it, my solar panels is equivalent to planting 351 trees over the past 12 months. So I, I feel like I'm doing my part. Everybody needs to be doing their part to be a little bit greener. But uh, we, need, we have more electric, electrical buses, uh, but the cost is very expensive. Is it worth spending more money on the buses to be more green? I don't see this, happen, this happening by 2030. Everybody needs, needs to do their part. And with 42% of the people uh, renting homes, they don't have the money to invest to put solar panels on their house or to be more greener. Uh, but that's, that's it. All right, thank you, Tony. Lori? I co-sponsored the sustainability ordinance, so clearly I believe in its effectiveness. And it is an aspirational goal, so 2030 is aspirational. It's not a hard line. We're already making strides in that direction, so we're already um, greener. We're looking at making our buildings uh, more efficient. I don't think solar panels alone are going to do what we need them to do. I think everybody uh, within the city, as an entity within the city, needs to do their part. But certainly, if we don't have goals, then we're, we're not going to move forward and eventually get to where we need to be. We, we have to take climate change seriously, and as a council right now, we do. And we're trying to get, up, we're trying to, get to that point where we can make changes and be a greener city. Thank you. Lori, you'll take this next question from Samantha. The city has invested millions of dollars in treating stormwater runoff um, and preventing pollutants from getting into the Spokane River. At the same time, the city's wastewater treatment plant, along with other polluters into the river, has asked the state for permission to dump more toxins into that river than state law allows. Is that the right direction to go? Why or why not? I don't think it is. I think that ecology initially, when we started building those CSO tanks, and when Ecology came to us and said, you can no longer dump directly in the river when we have a storm event, um, they were right. And we need to make sure that we're uh, discharging water that is the cleanest water possible for those downstream. And we've invested millions of dollars, as you said. We need to adhere to those standards, those high standards, and not go back to the way things were. Our river is our economic engine, so I see no point in degrading it at this point where we've invested so much money. So we need to continue on that path. Thank you. Tony? I think, I think the mayor's done a great job in getting money, the, getting the funds we needed to do this uh, project. Uh, millions of dollars were received from the federal, federal government. It wasn't all from taxpayers here in Spokane, Spokane Valley. Uh, for, I, I currently sit on the Spokane County Water Conservancy Board. We clean water, sewage water, that goes out cleaner in the water than what the water is today. So we're doing the right things right now to make our water cleaner, and we can't have other people upriver polluting in our current river system. Thank you, Tony. Tony, you'll take this next question from Doug. So, Tony, there's been a lot of questions about, well, there's been a lot of emphasis on the need for more housing in Spokane. But the question is, where are those houses going to go? Does the county need to extend its urban growth boundaries? Would you support that? 
or should the city continue to emphasize infill development? And then and what are the, the best incentives for those developers yeah. to build oh, more infill? Absolutely. We, we do have to extend our urban uh, county boundaries. Right now, we're so limited. What's happened over the past few years, the, wash, the realtors told us our real estate would go up. They told us our rent would go up if we, if we were stuck to this urban growth. Uh, right now, they're going to put 200 apartments on Regal, right across from Target. Where are all those cars going to go? Target Regal is already stopped, dead stop every day around 2.30, early in the morning. You can't, weekends when they're playing soccer. So we, that's not the right location to build. Where are we going to build? We need infrastructure. We need infrastructure throughout Spokane so we can build outside of Spokane. But we also got to build downtown. We got to build more housing downtown. We need more apartments. We need condos. We need everything from your first apartment to be able to move up to a condo, maybe even to a house, because that's the American dream is having a home. But right now, young people cannot afford a first time home. Look at the, the real estate here on the South Hill. It's going up for thirty, forty thousand dollars in the past couple of years per home. Who can afford that kind of increase? Thank you, Lori. I don't think we need to increase our urban growth boundary. We have opportunity right here in our centers and corridors in downtown. And we need to be looking at housing choices and affordability is one of the choices that, that we should be looking at. So kids that are coming out of their parents' basements and want a small place, people who are downsizing, all those are housing choices. And we shouldn't be spending more than 30% of our income on rent or a mortgage. And that's not the case right now. But we have opportunities, and we have given developers incentives. Uh, projects of significance is one incentive. We are also doing MFTEs for developers. So they have those incentives. They need to be using them, and we need to be working with them, I think, a little bit more in showing them how they can build and what is available in our city. Right, thank you, Lori. You'll take this next question, Lori, from Derek. All right, let's face it, mayors and city councils don't always get along, and that's been the case sometimes here in Spokane, uh, and not always pushing policies that a city council has passed. We'll soon be electing a new mayor, so how would you deal as a city council person with a difficult mayor? We have, since I've been on council, I made it a point to meet with the mayor once a month. And we've agreed more times than we've disagreed. The times that we've disagreed have, have been very fundamental things that were just ideologically opposed. However, I think it's healthy to have disagreements. I think when the citizens voted to have a strong mayor, strong council form of government, they expected that the legislative and the administrative branches of government were not always going to agree. And it's okay to do that. What we do have to do is, at the end of the day, come to some realization that we're not going to agree, but we're going to move forward with something that is going to be a little bit for everybody, and it eventually will work. So when we pass legislation, the mayor is in charge of implementing that legislation, and we would expect him to do so, whether he agrees or disagrees. Thank you. Tony? As city council, we do have to meet with our mayor. We have to know what's going on. We have to sit down and have a dialogue. We have to talk. We have to discuss what's going on. They, I may not agree with what the person wants to do at that time. He may not agree. She may not agree with what I want to do at that time. But we have to come with a consensus of what we want to do, what's best for Spokane. Uh, right, right now, the Spokane City Council, they're the legislative branch. They make the laws here in Spokane. It is up for the mayor to to enforce what we make, but we also have to make sure we're making good, sound laws that everybody can work with and agree with. Uh, we can do better. Uh, this is why we have elections. This is why we're out campaigning. You'll see little differences between this, the mayor and against each city, city council candidate. So it's up to the voter. It's up to you to decide what direction do you want the city, the city council and the mayor to go over the next four years. All right, thank you. Tony, you'll take this next question first from Samantha. One of the prop propositions on the ballot this, uh, this November it would ask public bargaining negotiating to come into the public eye. Um, is that the right choice for the city and how do you think that would impact the city's bottom line? Oh, absolutely. I think we need to be transparent. We need to know what's going on behind closed doors. When you see a lot of money being contributed to uh, campaigns, why is that money going there? We have to have transparency, so we need to vote for this so we can be a better Spokane and know what's happening behind, this, behind the doors. All right, thank you. Lori? I agree, transparency is a good thing, but not in this case. 
and I see this, if it passes, we're gonna land right in court and we're gonna lose. Um, when you talk about negotiating, you wanna make sure that both the person that's negotiating and the bargaining unit is able to speak freely. They would not be able to speak freely if they're under a microscope. So I absolutely don't think that is the right way for Spokane to go. Thank you. Lori, you will take this next question from Doug. So Lori, next year, I'm guessing, uh, there's a, a conversation going about the future of this current Spokane County Jail and whether a new facility is needed, how big, uh, all, a lot of different details. What are your views about a new jail? Uh, would you support a larger facility or do you, would you support something smaller with more diversion options? If we do build something, it needs to be with diversion options. We have no data right now on current data on what a new jail should look like, how big, uh, whether there would be diversion op options. Um, our jail is crowded right now primarily because we're housing federal prisoners and people are in jail who shouldn't be in jail. They're waiting trial or they're there for a small offense. So we need to look at all the options before we say, yes, we need a new jail. And what does it look like? Diversion, it has to be part of that equation. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, I believe we need a larger jail. I've listened to the sheriff, and the sheriff's out there saying we need a jail size for about 2,500 people uh, based on 5% of your population. But I think that's the discussion we need to have is what size jail we, we, we need. Yes, we are uh, populating uh, federal criminals in the jail, but we're making $80 per person. So we have to decide, do we want to keep that income coming in? I believe it's over about 105 people that we have jailed that are federal criminals, but we are making money on that. So we want to lose that income, or do we want to keep them there and have a larger jail? But I think our jail needs to have uh, drug addiction programs in it. We need to have mental health issue in it. We need to just not be a jail. We want to make sure when somebody's incarcerated that they come out being a productive citizens here in Spokane, that we, we welcome them all and they, they serve their time, that they're not a criminal forever. Thank you, Tony. You'll take this next question from Derek. The people of Spokane always need well-paying family wage type of jobs as a city council what can you do to continue to try to attract uh, businesses to come to spokane and, and offer those kind of uh, affordable jobs for for people here well we need to be business friendly we need, we need to make sure every business is welcome here in spokane uh, we have a lot of uh, minimum wage jobs we need to work with our county commissioners they're the, the ones that recruit businesses into our city uh, right now we just passed a, a new agreement with the commissioners that we're going to split uh, tax revenue from like Amazon, new businesses that come into uh, Spokane with the city and the county so we're not fighting whether that business goes in the city or the county. But we need good large paying jobs and we got to recruit them, uh, bring in the uh, Aerotech, high tech, bring in, you know, uh, Google, they, they're over, oversold in, uh, in Seattle. They, they're looking at Spokane. Let's, let's make sure they can come here and that we're going to be business friendly for them here in Spokane so we can have good paying jobs. Thank you, Tony. Lori? The best way to get new business here is to make sure we have the infrastructure to support that. And that's why we have our PDAs. We have three of them. And focusing businesses and attracting businesses to those areas is one way we can encourage them to come here. Uh, the county commissioners aren't the ones that recruit. It's uh, Greater Spokane, Inc. that does the recruiting, and that used to be our old Chamber of Commerce, and they've done a great job. B businesses are coming here because of our way of life and because it is cheaper than living on the west side. So we need to maintain our infrastructure. We need to maintain the quality of life that they've come here for in the first place for them to say, yes, I want Spokane to be our home. Thank you, Lori. Lori, you'll take this next question from Samantha. So according to census data, about 75% of workers in Spokane commute to work by themselves. Their average commute one way is about 20 minutes. What should the city be doing to reduce uh, those one way trips with one person in the car, if anything? I'm on the STA board, so I'm adamant that mass transit is the way to go. And we also need to look at a more bikeable, walkable city. So that means our bike infrastructure, and our sidewalks need to be up to standard. But we need to have a, a transit system that is easy to use, it's convenient, and will get you from point A to point B in a short amount of time. So it will be easier than actually jumping in your car and sitting in traffic. Thank you, Lori. Tony? 
I'm very fortunate because I just go downstairs and start work in my office. Uh, I don't have to drive 20 minutes every day. But uh, that, that's the norm. Can't, people don't want to be honest. People don't want to ride the bus every day. People don't want to ride the bike when it's 20 degrees outside. Our bike lanes aren't safe. When, when you talk to avid bikers that bike in the uh, bike every day, year round, they tell you they're, they're not safe. They're full of gravel. We don't keep them clean. We put snow on, on the bike lanes. Uh, how can we expect people to ride down the hills that aren't healthy enough to ride up and down a hill to go downtown to work? Uh, but can we have more buses, more bus routes running? People got to decide they want to run. I know I, I live out in Eagle Ridge, and you don't see a bus route out in Eagle Ridge. How can I take a bus? I used to take my daughter over to Eastern, uh, or to the, uh, she went, drove, to, drove the bus, but rode the bus to Eastern, just right down on Southeast Boulevard, which is great, great opportunity. Lots of kids were on the bus driving back and forth to Eastern, and we need to do things like that to make sure we have our young people riding the bus. All right, thank you. Tony, you will take this next question. So we've, um, we've been talking about the homelessness, and we've been talking about jail diversion and the need for more mental health and drug treatment. But I think if you talk to a lot of the social service agencies, they'd say we're maxed out right now. We're helping as many people as we can. So if there's more need for those, those services, how do you pay for those? Well, one thing, services like that, you look at individuals that don't have income. They should be on Medicaid. Medicaid's going to be paying for it. If they are disabled, then you, they're, even though they're not fit 65, they're eligible for Medicare. So there is insurance to get, the, get them there, but we have to hold them accountable. Uh, I've got friends that work in the industry, and they tell me 50% of the uh, people do not show up for their appointments that have mental health. And when they, when they do show up, they take their medications. They're not taking the medications. They sell them on the street. So we need to make sure they're held more accountable. Uh, we, we need services. Putting a shelter is not the way to go. Uh, making sure that we have the right services, that's where we need to put putting our money on. Uh, Union Gospel Mission, they're doing a great job helping people. Uh, we need to make sure they can have, let's make incentives where they can have another 30% increase in beds so they can take more people. Let's look at uh, Adult Teen Challenge. That they have 20 beds empty right now. They have they could use people that want to get help off their drugs. So we want, definitely want to support these industries. Okay, thank you, Lori. As I mentioned earlier, this is a regional problem, not a Spokane problem. We did get money from the state to build a mental health diversion uh, stabilization uh, facility, and we're going to be building that next year. So that's a start. And Tony's right. We can be uh, getting folks on Medicaid, Medicare, and disability, so there's money there. But I think we need to look outside of our community because you're right, we're tapped out. There is money at the state and we need to go back and ask for more so that we can treat people. Uh, I don't think that they should be required to be treated and I don't think it's a tough love issue. When you're in the throes of a mental health breakdown, you don't know that you need that help. So I think we do need professionals to assess that and, and uh, move forward with a, a line of treatment. This is our last question. Lori, you will take this one first from Derek. Well, you both have extensive resumes uh, from before becoming a public servant, or Tony, in your case, attempted to become a public servant. What is it about your work history uh, that you think makes you uniquely qualified to be city council? I was a journalist. And I, I'm curious, naturally curious, and I, I ask questions. I do a deep dive into issues, and I like to get involved. I like to get involved in my community, which I did before I moved here. And when I came here, that's one of the first things I did was to uh, join the, the neighborhood council. And I think that curiosity and that willingness to ask questions the willingness to take a deep dive and to connect with people so that I know what people are thinking, I know what matters to them, and I know what they care about. And that is what has made me a good city council member. Thank you, Lori. Tony? One thing, when, when you're running for office, you learn everything that you don't know and things you need to be more passionate about or, or consider. Uh, when I was, worked for the Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce, I was on the Government Actions Committee. I was on the Transportation Committee, so I, I learned the issues that we had in the Spokane Valley. But then, not only that, I went to all the town hall meetings. If a legislator was doing a town hall meeting, whether it be District 4, District 3, District 6, I attended because I needed to know what the issues are here in Spokane. So the past five years, I've been involved going to different town halls, going to different events, learning what our legislators are saying. 
uh, when they're trying to raise, raise money or what they're saying within their town hall. But it's important to be able to sit down, sit down with everybody and understand what, what's going on that you like about Spokane, what's going on you don't like about Spokane, what changes would you make. Maybe there's something compromised right in the center that we, we all agree on. Maybe there's not. Uh, but we've got to really sit down and listen to make sure we're moving forward and keeping Spokane great. All right, well, we have this next question for Tony from Samantha. So you mentioned accountability for folks who are uh, maybe homeless, they've got drug addiction, mental health issues. It's frequently challenging to keep up with responsibilities when you're going through those kind of things. What would that kind of accountability look like to get people into treatment who are willing and ready for that? Well, one thing during my campaign, I've met Ed Stevenson with Life Recovery Solutions. He has this app that we can give to every homeless person. And I didn't realize 60% of our homeless, they have cell phones. And with, with this app, we can track them. How are you feeling today? You, do you, you have appointments today? Are you going to your appointment? Then I'll ask later, did you make your appointment? How do you feel after, after your appointment? It's holding them more accountable. Oh, we have housing come up for you. Uh, we found the shelter. Where are you located? We can send a car to pick you up. Great app. We need to be investing in simple services like this. Four or five dollars a person that's homeless, that need, needs help, that has, has a cell phone, they can be on this app where we can truly help them and help make sure they're being accountable. But I look at it, if you have a mental health issue and you're not making an appointment and you miss three appointments, then we gotta say you can't go back into the, another appointment because we're, we're scheduling precious time for somebody that doesn't show up and we can't do that. Okay, thank you, Lori. The reason Housing First works is people are in a stable environment and they're able to access services if you offer wraparound services. To expect somebody who's going through a mental health crisis, drug addiction, as a homeless person on the street to be successful is not realistic. So when you say, how do we deal with them or how do we hold them accountable? Housing, get them into housing and remember that not all people who are houseless are mentally ill or drug addicted, but the ones that are, everybody needs a place to be stable before you can actually give them treatment or offer treatment. All right, Lori, you will take this next question from Doug. So what would a Spokane City Council debate be without a streets question, huh? So Lori, you referenced in your, your closing about the arterial, the aggressive arterial streets program. Do you believe the priorities are right in those six-year programs or uh, because we've heard people talk about the need for more repairing of potholes, that there are lots of miles in this town that aren't paved. What do you think about the priorities of the streets program? So the six-year street plan is great as far as it goes. As council, we have the discretion to do a little bit of moving things around. For example, uh, Freya wasn't, North Freya wasn't on the streets uh, program, uh, six-year street plan. And we put it there because it's in a PDA, and that was important for that street to be rebuilt. We are also taking a portion of that money, and we are paving those streets that are now dirt. So a percentage of money is going to go to each of the districts so that streets that aren't paved are going to be paved. That's going to take some time. We've got 50, about 54 miles of unpaved streets, so that's going to take some time. But our infrastructure is absolutely critical. We have paved over, or as I said, um, developed over half of our arterial streets right now. So we're on a path, but it, it takes time. If you were to do it all at once, you'd have gridlock and people wouldn't be able to get from point A to point B. So it, it is a plan and we have to follow it. Thank you, Lori. Tony? Well, one thing, I'm voting no on 976 because I don't want to lose 50% of our funding that goes towards fixing our roads, fixing our streets. Uh, that, that's a big intake. Uh, we have 60 miles of streets that are not paved here in Spokane, and people have lived on these streets for 40 and 50 years, and I don't understand a city our size, why have we not put this in our 25-year comprehensive plan? This needs to be in our six-year plan to make sure over time all 60 miles are paved, because we owe that to our citizens. We owe basic infrastructure. Uh, you drive down 11th Street, 12th Street, right off of Freya, they're not paved. You go down Cuba, which I talk about all the time, they have a sign that says, uh, slow down, no, no, no uh, dust zone. Like instead of a no wig zone, it says no dust zone. That's, you know, that's sending a message home that we need to pave our, our streets, all streets, and make sure we use good material so they're not filled with potholes two years later. Thank you, Tony. You'll take this next question from Derek. I guess we'll keep this one a little bit light. Uh, 
living in the district, what is your favorite part about the district that uh, you represent or hope to represent? Go ahead, Tony. I say downtown. Well, I, living in Eagle Ridge, uh, we have parks in Eagle Ridge where we can go out and visit. We, we have paths where we can take my dog Zeus for a walk. Uh, he loves walking all, all the little trails that we have in Eagle Ridge. You know, not every neighborhood has that. I love, I go to move fitness right here. On the, I spend a lot of time up here on the South Hill because I've lived right here at 40th and Regal for, for ages. And this is, you know, our home. Uh, I love going to Perry dis District. There's a, the Perry Fair every year is great. Going downtown, we, we, we go to P.F. Chang's a lot of times. Uh, that's our favorite restaurant for the kids to go to. Uh, of course, my wife's work is downtown, so we do spend a lot of time downtown. All right, thank you, Lori. Certainly our parks. I'm within walking distance of four parks. One of them is Manitou, and I absolutely love it. But the other thing is I'm able to hop on a bus and get downtown in eight minutes. And I think that's fabulous. And our downtown is walkable. You can go from one end to the other. It's, it's not a stretch at all, and it's diverse. So you see different things as you're going through it, and I absolutely love our downtown. I'm on the DSP board, and I'm probably the biggest booster of downtown on that board because I think it's a, a fabulous asset and certainly our river as well. Thank you. Well, that'll have to be the last question and it's time now for closing statements. And we did the coin flip earlier and Lori, you'll go first with closing Thank statements. You. When my husband and I moved here about 20 years ago, I got involved in our neighborhood council and I realized that neighborhood concerns weren't always heard by the city council or the administration. And I ran for office because citizens were concerned about property crime, a lack of voice in how their neighborhoods were changing, and crumbling infrastructure. Solutions take time. Since I've been on council, property crime is down over the last year and continuing to drop. We funded 25 more police since I've been on council, and 20 more are scheduled for next year. Major arterials have been rebuilt, redesigned, reconstructed, I sponsored and council passed a robust historic preservation ordinance. And for the first time ever, we collaborated with the school district to get libraries and schools together, saving taxpayer dollars. Spokane is thriving, and I believe I can continue to help it thrive. Please vote for me, Lori Kinnear for city council. Thank you, Lori. Tony? I'm running for city council to make a positive change. Uh, right now, I, when I've been doorbelling, Everybody tells me, they tell me over and over, I don't feel safe. But we have data saying that Spokane is safer today, but we're hiring more and more police. Why do we not feel safe? If you don't feel safe, then you need to vote for Tony Key because we'll make a change. Uh, our homeless situation, our homeless has increased over the past four years. So if you believe that it's increased, that you think we need to do better, you need to vote for Tony Keepy. I love Spokane, but I want to make sure I represent each and every one here in Spokane. Uh, it's time for a change, time for positive change. I want you to go to votetonykeepy.com and check out my website. If you have questions, feel free to give me a call at 509-934-7455. Our infrastructure, why are we just now talking about we need better infrastructure? Why are we just talking about hiring more police? We've had four years to do this, so now's the time to make that change. Thank you very much. I appreciate your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Well, that will have to do it for this debate. Our thanks to the candidates, Tony Keepy and Lori Kinnear. Our thanks as well to our journalists, to Doug, Doug Negvornik, Samantha Wolfile, and Derek Dice. The debate and other election specials can be found online at our website, ksps.org. Just look for the election 2019 icon. For all of us at KSPS, thanks for watching.